Welcome to Cancer Talks, a podcast sharing stories of personal transformation and collective healing from people who have been touched by cancer. My name is Claire, and I'll be guiding today's conversation. If you're listening on an iPhone, click the plus sign in the upper right corner to follow our show and get notified when a new episode is released. My guest today is Elizabeth Benedict, a best-selling author whose novels include Almost and Slow Dancing. Her nonfiction spans a range of themes from sexual politics to money to literature and includes The Joy of Writing Sex, which has been the classic reference for writing about sex in fiction for the past 25 years. In this episode, we explore many different ways of understanding the cancer journey, including the way a doctor's own emotional landscape can affect the process of diagnosing a patient. Hi, Elizabeth. Welcome to Cancer Talks. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. So we often like to start with asking your earliest memory of cancer. My earliest memory of the idea of cancer? Yeah. Ooh, that's that's a bad one because uh, when I was about six years old, my cousin, a beloved cousin who was about 20, had cancer and died. So it, it was very young mm-hmm. and it was a real tragedy in our family. He was my mother's sister's only child so so it was there from the beginning time yeah and do you remember it being on your mind like from that point between that point and your own diagnosis no uh no that I don't think um it, it was on my mind as I knew a parent's friend had lung cancer when I was maybe eight or ten <laughs> and I believe she died but then when I was a senior in high school, I write about this in the book. This is how I opened the book. One of the girls in my class came to school one day and said, gee, I have this bump over here on my sort of on my chin, my neck. And this girl was dead about two or three months later. Wow. And I, I went to, a, for two years, I went to a very small girls private school in New York, which had not been my life. I'd gone to public school for almost all the time. And for a series of reasons, I ended up at this very, very good girls private school, which sort of changed my life. And we had 22 girls in our entire grade. Yeah, this girl died. And so it was very traumatic. And she wasn't a friend of mine. But of course, there were 22 kids in the class. And yeah, it was pretty shocking. And she had lymphoma. So that that sort of set me on the path yeah. to thinking about cancer almost all the time. Yeah. So what um yeah, what like associations or emotions or what was the feeling around cancer in those early memories and the adults around you and the adults around me? I, I wasn't too aware of the adults around me, mm-hmm. but I was just whenever I had any kind of bump anywhere, I'd sort of freak out. If I okay. had a you know, yeah. small lymph nodes, I would freak out. Um, so I was just sort of terrorized and terrified that any kind of bump was was cancer. The adults around me, I I, I didn't have much to do with the adults. Yeah. <laughs> around me. Um, I mean, I I was a senior in high school. My parents were getting divorced. Mm-hmm. In a weird way, I they they were dealing with their own problems. Yeah, I was dealing with my problems. Uh, and I went to college, and I sort of never saw them again. I mean, it wasn't quite like I never saw uh-huh. them again, but. I I never went home again after that. I mean, yeah. I never lived at home again. I never went home for a summer. I there wasn't a place for me okay. to go. My parents yeah. split up, and that was the end of our family. So I was sort of on my own. Yeah, when I went to college. So the adults around okay. me. Okay, yeah, were, interesting. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times when I ask the early memory question, people are describing how grownups were relating to cancer, but you actually have these like, very vivid memories of. Yeah. of your own childhood yeah. relationship. Yeah. My and my cousin dying, you know, was was a, a huge tragedy in my family and um but of course I didn't it wasn't it, it my my aunt his mother had had an x-ray when she was pregnant and everyone a full body x-ray for some mm-hmm. weird reason. Uh and it was felt that that x-ray had caused the cancer that her son had. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, this was like the yeah. early 
and not quite the early days of radiation, but this was many decades ago, mid 20th century. Yeah. And my cousin was much, of course, much older than I was. And my, my mother was the youngest of all of her siblings. So, so yeah, cancer was, was very present, but it, it was just more the sadness around it rather than the disease itself, you know, the sadness around death, the the sort of the likelihood of catastrophe was always Mm -hmm. kind of hovering around our family. Yeah. It wasn't so much cancer. It was like something really awful was going to happen. happen. (laughs) And should we fast forward? Just don't need to spend too much time on it, but I'm curious about your own experience of diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, in 2017, I f- sort of had this weird feeling in in my sort of inside my shoulder girdle for a few weeks, and I kept thinking, "Oh, there's so- something there. I wonder what it is." It was, and it was very indistinct, and it was didn't hurt, and it wasn't there all the time, and I didn't mention it to anyone. And then one night, I put my hand under my armpit, and I felt this thing that that was just like Boeing, you know, like a I was like a cartoon character with my eyes popping out. And it was really a a thing like you don't want to feel in your body and that I'd never felt. And uh, of course, when you're a woman, you're always kind of touching your breasts and you're doing these things and hyper vigilant and hyper aware. And, you know, you're thinking about cancer all the time because of uh, mammograms and stuff. But this was in my armpit and it was very distinctive. And that was the beginning of my cancer journey. Um, and I went to the doctor 12 hours later. So it was 11 o'clock at night. I went to the doctor the next day at noon. And even though I went to the doctor right away uh, through a series of crummy doctors and just dreadful, you know, dreadful people um, mm-hmm. and my own fear combined and s- people going on summer vacation because it was the beginning of the uh-huh. summer, uh, it took three months for this thing to be diagnosed. Whoa. And it was a huge sort of ridiculous, I don't want to say a disaster, but re- it was really yeah. a lot of bad stuff. It, in, Did you feel confident that it was cancer from the beginning or were you in purgatory? Well, no, I, I, I wasn't confident. No, I didn't yeah. know what it was. I mean, it could have been a cyst. It could have been, and for a long time, people kept telling me it was a swollen lymph node. Mm-hmm. My doctors, and I had it, sonogrammed literally within days and the sonogram people they mismeasured the size of it which uh-huh. i didn't know for a month so everyone was reading it the wrong size and the other thing is they said oh there isn't one swollen lymph node there are two swollen lymph nodes one was under the other i could only feel one and i think that was a tip off that this was not just a swollen lymph node but doctors and these people said having mismeasured it, they measured it as smaller than it was. And again, I didn't know that until six weeks later Mm -hmm. when I got it measured again. But they said, come back in two or three weeks if it hasn't been resolved. And when I went to my doctor and said, well, I need a prescription to go back. She said, oh, no, no. What they meant was you go back for another sonogram. And then if it's still there, then we get a PET scan. And I think it was just like bad communication. But that was a critical moment when something should have happened and it didn't. Yeah. And I had encounters with doctors around that and everyone kept telling me it was a swollen lymph node and I had to chill and my and I should go to a breast specialist and I should deal with my anxiety and take tranquilizers for my anxiety. Wow. And so it that was like a really bad moment and then they said well go to another kind of doctor. Go to an endocrinologist. Sure. And I went to an endocrinologist and it's all of this is very hard to do. You can't just like walk it. It's not like walking to a grocery store. You have to write insurance and the doctor has to be there. And I went to this endocrinologist and I said, I have this bump lump under my arm. And he went, oh my God, it's huge. And he should have said, this needs to be biopsied right this minute. That was the right answer. And he didn't say that. He said, mm-hmm. oh, let's deal with your other symptoms. Let's get you another kind of test. Let's get you a test about this. Let's get you a test about that. And this guy was like an, a, an established doctor on Madison Avenue, yeah, right near Mount Sinai Hospital. And I had insurance. I mean, it was not, yeah. 
it was a what really- do you think they were all avoiding? <laughs> uh, I, I I don't know, but you might say that they they didn't want to be the one to tell me I had cancer because they wanted to have another doctor tell me I had cancer. I don't yeah. know. I mean, I have since talked to doctors who said a doctor when they feel something under your arm like what I had, which at that point was three centimeters Mm because it had been mismeasured. I didn't know it then. And they, he said, it's huge. They know they can tell the difference between a swollen lymph node and some, a malignancy. Mm -hmm. And so the most charitable explanation I can think of is that they wanted somebody else to tell me I had cancer, or maybe they don't know what a malignant thing feels like in your arm. I don't know. It was there. It was like there for the seeing. And then uh, two weeks later, after going through these very expensive other tests about my parathyroid, Mm -hmm. then I finally went to a doctor at Mount Sinai Hospital who felt this thing and said, oh, this needs to be biopsied. I was about to go on vacation the next day. And it was like, wait a second. I came here about my parathyroid. I've been dealing with this for six weeks. I'm going on vacation tomorrow where not only is it a vacation, it's a working vacation. I have clients and public appearances, you're going to tell, I don't want to find out I have cancer today. And unless you tell me (laughs) that I need to do this today and put everything on hold. Yeah. If you tell me that I'll do it. And the guy said, no, it's okay. Go on your vacation. Oh, wow. So it was like, okay. I mean, I was, I was trying to really be very conscientious. I went on vacation, came back, had an appointment with this guy, and then he went on vacation. Oh my God. Literally, he said, oh, I, I'll be back at the end of September. It's like, mm-hmm. but, and in the meantime, it's growing. Well, it's growing, but they're also, it's like, nobody's telling me what it is. And they don't yeah. know whether it's a metastasis metastas- from something else, whether it's breast cancer, whether it's lung cancer. I mean, it was just like, oh, well, don't worry about it. These things grow slowly. Oh, if it is cancer, we'll deal with it. And you can't get a new doctor on August 15th. Yeah. Totally. You just can't. It doesn't happen. Like if you need uh, emergency surgery, I guess you can walk into an ER, but you yeah. can't get a doctor who's going to do a biopsy and give you the re- result on August 15th. They're all on vacation. I mean, unless your brother is a doctor, you know, this, you just are, you are at the mercy of uh, the, the system. Yeah. So this guy said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a biopsy today and then I'm going on vacation. I'm like, I, I, what could I, I, I couldn't say you can't go on vacation. Yeah. I mean, you could say that, but you sound <laughs> like an idiot. And, and also I wouldn't. And I said, well, will somebody get back to me if this is, if they need to? And he said, yes, don't worry. So I got, okay. What do you say? I, I wasn't going to have a temper tantrum. I mean, I suppose I could have, I would now. <laughs> now yeah. I know that you, you do need to have a temper tantrum, mm-hmm. but so a lot of things conspired to, keep the diagnosis from happening. I'm curious about, yeah, when it did happen. Uh, So I finally had to get a, a first he, first they do a fine needle aspiration. That's the first step where they stick a needle in and they pull some cells out and they say, oh, these are abnormal cells. Yeah. That happened on August 15th. Uh, Then the doctor did another thing where he pulled out um, more cells with a, a on the spot sort of extraction thing and he said, I don't know. These usually don't work. If it doesn't work, hmm. then we have to do a full, we have to open you up under anesthesia and cut this thing and get it biopsied. That didn't happen. I didn't get the result. That didn't happen until September 11th. And I got the results on September 19th because he was on vacation. And when that happened and I was finally diagnosed with lymphoma, the doctor at Mount Sinai said, here's the head of our lymphoma treatment center, call him right away. And I called right away. And I was told his first appointment was in two months. Yeah. Where I'd been a patient, I'd been a patient at this hospital for two months. And I fortunately had the name of another doctor from a friend just by accident. And I called him up and I spoke to him that night and I became his patient that minute and everything changed at that moment. But the only reason I could see him was because I had changed my insurance and I had, now I had out of network coverage that cost me $1,800 a month. And that was only because I changed my insurance the minute I felt the lump in my arm. 
Oh, I could, wow. I could Before not the have, diagnosis. I could not have gone to that doctor. Yeah. If I hadn't changed my insurance. And I and and the only reason I could change my insurance is because I happened to have enough money yeah. to go for this ridiculous insurance, which I couldn't have done indefinitely. I could have I did it for six months. And if you waited until the diagnosis, it probably would have been a higher premium also, right? Once if you were trying to get on. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. But but it was only because I was I had heard about cancer from, you know, from a young age that I knew to change my insurance right wow. away. And it was only because I, at that point in my life, had the resources. Most times in my life, I would not have been able to pay $1,800. Yeah. So it was a series of bizarre. And, and so the doctor I ended up calling happened to be the premier lymphoma doctor in the world. Oh, wow. Not just a good doctor. And you didn't even know. Well, I, I knew I when know. I called him that he was a legendary doctor, but I just yeah. found out about him from a friend whose mother had gone to see him. Yeah. Wow. So it wasn't, it was just a sort of accident that mm-hmm. I ended up with him because the guy at Mount Sinai was booked. And, and so I am speaking from a very privileged position of somebody who had all these yeah. like uh, financial opportunities and also just some really good luck. And I, and I realized that maybe my case isn't typical, but also my case was atypical because it took these people so long to, to diagnosis. And in answer to your question, why did it take these doctors so long? I, I really, in, in some way, I think that they, they don't want to be the one to tell you, you have cancer. They don't want to deal with your meltdown in, in their office. They yeah. go, oh, this is probably cancer. I'll let the other guy deal with it. I, I, but, I, but that, that may be a very uncharitable, um, comment but but you I mean you explore this idea in your book about how doctors own emotional experience informs the way they diagnose or or interact with patients which I think is it's an important thing to talk about because in western medical culture there is a tendency to um, relate to doctors as scientists or as like objective actors who are Mm -hmm. who are just reading the facts mm-hmm. than giving you the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is, it, is there anything more you want to say about well that idea? Um, doctors are. I, I think it's different for oncologists. Okay, uh, because do- oncologists are dealing with cancer. That's their subject. So they're not going to they're not going to fool around with you. Yeah. For the in terms of yeah a diagnosis, they may not want to talk to you about. Uh, whether you should do another chemo when you're at death's door, you know that. that uh, I read uh, Atul Gawande's book on, mm-hmm. I think it's called on mortality, and he talks about how little training doctors have in death and dying. Death. They have yeah. a lot of training in prolonging people's lives, but not a lot in the discussions around death and dying and in facing death and dying. And Americans don't like that. I mean, if you are in a more, if you're in an older culture the Chinese and Indian and so forth. Death and dying is fact of life. Um, and here it, we we like to postpone it and, and not talk about it for, for as long as possible. And so doctors are not trained in having these conversations and in, and in confronting death and dying. And so they're just uncomfortable about it. They don't yeah. know how to do it. And it takes longer than saying, oh yeah, sure, have another chemo treatment. I mean, it takes a lot more emotional skill and more time. Yeah, and then there's un- underneath there is the assumption that cancer means death or something. Yeah, and and obviously it does in 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 a lot of cases, um, but it also uh, in the the last twenty years have seen enormous strides in cancer treatment, and but but just the word itself. Somebody uh, one of my events, somebody said, um, "How come?" we don't use the word cancer. I mean, how come it's, how come it's such a upsetting word? Yeah. And uh, the woman I was talking to said for, for many years, we didn't even say the word. It was the C word because it was so terrifying. I had a, a, a friend whose mother was sick. This was about 20 years ago. And she called it rock neck, which was cancer backwards. She couldn't even say the word. Rock neck. Yeah. And, oh, wow. and she, the, you, the word is so terrifying, you know, because um because for so long it meant just death there was you it, you were you were a uh, a victim as soon as yeah. you had it yeah 
And, you know, to talk about military metaphors, you were, you know, a victim of this, of this war, you were going to lose the war. Yeah. And so it, it made sense that it was so scary. You that little word, you know, meant you were about to, you know, fall into the ocean without a lifesaver. Yeah. Now, and now it's quite different in in so many cases. In so many cases, it's different. But in not every case, and not enough cases, but in many cases, and it's going to take a long time for our uh, reflexes to catch right. up the with, fear. Uh, with with the medical reality that many cancers are let's say they're either curable or they they can put you you can be put into remission for a long 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 time right but of course you have to know which ones those are and whether that's yours and and it depends on the person yeah much uncertainty but that's one of our main motivations for telling these stories on the podcast is rewriting the story so that cancer is not understood as a death sentence yeah and i was doing an interview last night at a bookstore of a a book by a woman who had facial cancer. She was about to be an opera singer. She was you know, wow. rehearsing and practicing and, and she found this lump in her tooth that, that they thought was an abscess, but was actually face cancer. And her cancer was stopped, but she had to get her face reconstructed. Wow. So there's all kinds of there's so many variations in this. So many. Uh, it, it's like, it's hard to get your head around. And when you get a diagnosis or when you think you might have cancer, you just don't know wh- where you fall on the... Right, you know, what that the, even means. Yeah. There's so many things it could mean. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I always tell people and I always tell myself how much progress has been made in so many cancers. and. I, whenever I get a mammogram, I, I write down a list of all the people I know who have breast cancer. And like 99.9% of them are alive and they've had Amazing. breast cancer, you know, for 20 years. They, yeah. had, they, were, they were diagnosed, they were treated 20 years ago. So it's a very different disease than it was 20 years ago. That doesn't mean everybody gets the same outcome, but I, I do make these lists. I can, I yeah. can show them to <laughs> That's you. That's a good exercise. <laughs> It's sort of like when I go on airplanes and I'm afraid I write down lists of people who are always on airplanes and like, they're, they're on airplanes. Okay, they're <laughs> they're on airplanes. Yeah, I can be, on, I can be <laughs> with them on the airplane. <laughs> I like that technique. <laughs> um, what, one thing that's in, in relation to sort of my making lists, um, I, I was once waiting to hear from a doctor. I was sitting in the doctor's office and, and he came, he was going to tell me whether my mammogram was okay. And and I held up this list. He was like, what is that? What are all those names? <laughs> like, why are you writing down these names? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and it was your list of everyone who was alive. <laughs> and cancer. what did he say? <laughs> oh, you know. Okay. He said, you don't have breast cancer. I said, great, goodbye. You know, that's okay. all. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, but in relation to that, um, you know, kind of survival technique. Yeah. Um, because we all need them, whether we get cancer or not, because mm-hmm. we're always sort of in danger of having cancer, right? I mean, every women women have to touch their breasts once a month and get them checked once a month. I mean, we're there to find out if we have cancer. Of course, we're nervous wrecks, right? How could we not be? But when I did have cancer, the people I wanted to talk to were people who'd had cancer. And so mm-hmm. those were the friends I called. And I said, just tell me your story. And it yeah. was just, and, and my my two of my closest friends have not had cancer, thank thank the Lord. But when once you've had cancer, you're kind of in this weird club where mm-hmm. you you've kind of you know you face the demons, like you've you've you face the worst thing, or yeah. you face something that's really scary. And you can talk to somebody else about it in a way that even the people who love you a great deal can't. Right. And I found it very comforting just to talk to people who'd had cancer and were alive. Yeah. I mean, that was like, keep talking. You know, I just called them and say, tell me what <laughs> happened to you. And you, we just need to know that people survive. A lot of people survive. Yeah. I'm curious how you started thinking about the warlike metaphors with cancer. Or like, um, 
Yeah, just how that I didn't, framework. I didn't start thing. thinking about them. Susan Sontag started thinking about okay, them. Okay, so you're reading um, yeah. And um, she started thinking about them, at least formally, um, when she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1975. And her book came out in 1977 called Illness as Metaphor. And she didn't write at all about her own illness in the book, but she examined cancer metaphors and illnesses, the ways that we talk about illnesses metaphorically. And her conclusion is basically that while the illness is, is not yet curable, we metaphorize it. We, we talk about it in metaphors because we can't, we don't have a cure. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of attach, you know, a sort of colorful language to it to because we, we can't just, you know, take a pill and really get over it. it. Yeah. Uh, and so she talks about TB and how TB taught people who had TB would, would talk about having rosy cheeks and being, you know, flushed and red and, and it overexcited. And, and, and then once TB became curable, all of that stuff went away. And she said, right now, cancer is, cancer is talked about as a battle and a war. And we have to go into battle in order to fight cancer. Yeah. And people are died after a long battle with cancer. And at the time, this was 1975. Um, and at the time, you know, you were going into battle and you were likely to lose the battle mm -hmm. in many cases. And that was part of her argument. The second part of her argument was that when you turn it into a battle and a war that you're likely to lose, you would be less inclined to fight because you knew that you were going up against a big army by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that people should stop thinking about it metaphorically and just say, I have a disease, I need to get treated. Mm -hmm. And that, that it, it could be helpful to people to take away those metaphors and just see it as, a, as an illness that needed to be treated. And that's kind of what her book is about. So when I got sick, and, and Susan Sontag had stage four breast cancer, and she was given a very, very grim diagnosis. And because of her own inner resources, but also money that she could have access to, she found doctors who treated her and she survived for 30 years with, you know, having conquered, conquered breast cancer in the battle. She had, she get, then got other kinds of cancer, but a, a lot of people in her situation would have just listened to the doctors and said, okay, I give up. I mean, yeah. I, I'm, there's nothing for me to do. I'm, I'm sunk. I'm losing this battle. But anyway, I, I, I read her book and I, I re remember reading her book in about 1992 or three, just because it was interesting to me. So when I got sick, which was 2017, so that was like 25 years later, more than more than 25 years later, I wondered whether people still used military metaphors. And so yeah. I just started thinking about that and whether enough had changed in cancer treatment and cancer outcomes that we could get rid of the military metaphors. Yeah. And my sense is that we have that th those metaphors have sort of, they've deflated some. And indeed, people do have long struggles with cancer because that's the nature of it. But quite often, it's just like, okay, I'm going for treatment. And now I, I maybe, oh, it's recurred. Now I have another treatment. Okay. We've kind of, um, it's, it's become much less charged and much less metaphorical. It's just, you, you go for a treatment and you, you're over it. Yeah, or you're over it. It's in remission that you know you anticipate something else, but it's not about fighting a war anymore. I don't know whether I'm sure there are people who would differ with me, and and maybe there are oncologists who would say no, no, no. It's still it's still a war. It's still a battle. But I think for some cancers, it's it's really changed, and I think some of the language has changed in 25 years. Yeah, well, it's interesting to think about when Sontag was writing where the metaphor, the main problem she's having with making these metaphors around cancer are that we're not just looking it in the face as a disease that needs to be dealt with. That Now that feels, it feels like there's enough medical understanding of cancer that people approach it as a disease to cure. Yeah. And, and, there, and there are so many more treatments. Yeah. But then there's a secondary thing, which is the sort of yes, spiritual or emotional um, baggage mm -hmm. around cancer 
and and the choices that we have in terms of how we want to relate to it. Because there still is a lot of culture, I would say, even for people who are like, this is a disease, I'm going to the doctor, I'm going to fix it. There are definitely thousands, maybe millions of people who hold on to a sort of warlike mentality that's about, I'm going to brute strength my way through this. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm strong, I'm a cancer warrior. Mm -hmm. And then once they get NED, I'm a survivor. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's not so much like we're masking it and turning it into something that we don't even understand, but there's still um, a lot of militant language. Well, yeah, I, I, I think there is, but it's also because the treatment is often extremely brutal. Yeah. I mean, it's th- 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 that is a, that is a word that, um, that fits, you know, it's yeah. really brutal and it's, you know, it's painful and it's debilitating and you're not yourself and your hair falls out and you're, it's disfiguring. And it also, it doesn't just end. It, it's like you have to get all the treatment and then you have to see if it works and then you have to see if it's keeping to keeping working. So it, it, it is, it, it does have a, like a long life or a long um, t- tail. Uh, you know, if you, if you get, you you have a broken leg and you get your leg surgery you you know whether it works or not it's it doesn't yeah. take you know 2 years of follow ups but cancer in the nature of it, it it really you you do have to gird yourself for for battle in a certain way if you want to think of it that way and you also have to put your life on hold you know and you have to say okay i'm not going to be able to work i'm not going to be able to do this i'm not going to be able to you know there it, it's not just like i'm going to have my surgery on monday so it, it's hard <laughs> it's, yeah. it's it's painful it's hard so there's still a lot of people for whom it is very difficult the treatment is really difficult yeah. the, and then there are also people like who just have surgery and then that's all they're supposed to get but in the meantime you don't really know where which group you fall in when it happens because there are so many variables. So, I mean, it really, it really is a big, you know, pain in the neck in the largest sense. Right. And you can see why, you know, you, you want to be a cancer warrior, but maybe, maybe that just, maybe instead of looking at the bright side, maybe you can be a cancer warrior because you know that there's a chance you're going to make it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, as opposed to 25, 30 years ago, it was like, sure. you, you didn't even, you didn't even try to be a cancer warrior because you were not going to make it. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you were, you were going to lose that battle before you even mm-hmm. started. And now, you know, when I was treated in 2017, I had uh, a very, what was called a treatable kind of lymphoma, but I had a weird gene that made the treatment more unpredictable, but I, I I was I'm fine now, touch wood. So five or six years later, I'm fine. But at, for a long time, they didn't know whether the treatment was going to work. But one of the things I did when I was writing the book is I called the doctor who treated me, this legendary guy, years after. And I said, you know, I was so terrified when I was your patient to find out what it meant to have this gene that you told me was a problem. But what would have happened if I hadn't responded to the treatment, to the first treatment? And he said, well, you know, we would have done this. We would have done that. We would have done this. These are other treatments. These have emerged since 2017. Oh, wow. It's like unbelievable. Now, there, there at the time in 2017, there was, I, I could have gotten a, I think like a bone marrow transplant mm-hmm. if the tre- if the chemo and radiation hadn't worked. And so that existed. But since then, there are even other, and, and that's a really big deal. Nobody wants to do that. But but as I say, there are other treatments, and I can't go into them because I don't understand them. I don't want to know about. I if I need to know, I'll I'll yeah. find out. But I, I'm very much like, don't tell me unless I need to know this. But there are really breakthrough treatments regularly in cancer, not in every kind of cancer, but in a lot of cancers. And I think it's really important. I try to say this all the time. You know, if you think something is weird with your body, don't <laughs> don't be afraid. Ha ha. But b- believe that there are new treatments all the time and you don't, you're not going into battle. There's all kinds of treatments that didn't exist five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And there are people working on this every minute of every day. I mean, the cancer research people are like my heroes and they just, this is what they do, you know, all day long. And so we're the, we're the beneficiaries of, of all this brilliance and commitment. Um, 
what point in your cancer journey did you start writing this memoir? It's hard to say. Um, I, as I write about in the book, when I was going, I had to go to the hospital for five days to get this chemo because I had this weird gene. And I bought a box of botanical postcards at the Museum Metropolitan Museum of Art. And they were just like these beautiful cards. And I started writing on them, just writing things down like a diary. And I, I couldn't quite commit myself to a diary. I think that would have uh, been too intimidating. For yourself. For so you didn't you weren't yeah. sending them to anyone? Yeah. Oh no, no, no. Yeah. I, and in the book, I sort of think I'm gonna send them to people, but I'm I, you know. But no, I, I it was sort of like a diary, and and I think because they were beautiful, it was it was easy to do. It was like oh, I could look at these beautiful cards and just write short things. I didn't have to sort yeah. of write a big account. And I I liked that the, the cards were beautiful, and it was in a beautiful box, and and that was where I first started writing things down. And I filled up you know a lot of those cards, and you know I I thought about writing a lot, uh, and I started many times. But I never, for a long time, I didn't know what the story was because I didn't know whether I was going to be somebody whose cancer recurred or treatment didn't yeah. work. And so I, I wasn't sure what my tone would be. And I, when I finally sort of just said, okay, just write it down, I guess I started writing it maybe three or four months after the treatment ended. And I wrote an account that was just sort of, this is what happened. And it was 250 pages long. Huh. And, and I, I've written many books, so it's not, you know, but writing a book, I mean, writing a book is always hard, but it wasn't like I'd never written a book. I, I, I write all the time. And um, I showed it to some friends who were writers and editors and nobody liked it. <laughs> what and, did they say about it? Well, one friend who, who's a very close friend, who's an, a magazine editor, and I write for him all the time. And he was, he's very kind. Okay. But he's also very blunt. And he said, I think only your friends will want to read this, which yeah. means it's not very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was the most useful thing. My, my two other friends sort of, was like, it, it didn't just didn't quite, they, they didn't have like really firm things to say, but it was just, it was just, not very interesting. I think that was the the idea. And I, I sort of knew that too. I just didn't know how else, what else to do. Yeah. And then COVID happened and I had to put the manuscript. I thought, oh, who's going to care about me and my cancer, even if it were interesting. Yeah. And so I put it away for a long time, put the manuscript away. So I'm not going to do anything with this. And I went back to it and kept fiddling around and a few months later, I talked to another friend who's a writer and editor, and I hadn't told a lot of people that I was sick. And I told this guy that I was writing a cancer memoir, and he said, um, how long is it? And I said, 250 pages. And he said, too long. Nobody with cancer wants to read something that long. Mm -hmm. And I said, he said, how long are the chapters? And I said, oh, you know, 10 pages, 20 pages, too long, much too long. Nobody wants to read anything that long. Uh, he said, I'm writing a book now and no chapter is longer than 900 words. Wow. And so I hung up the phone and I completely rewrote my book. And I just broke it down into these 900 word chapters, which is what you're reading now. Yeah. And and when I did that, it really completely changed. And it just had this sort of energy and humor and uh, velocity that it didn't have. Yeah. It does. It has so much momentum. And um, yeah, you, you go many different places with, from talking about other writers to um, these beautiful character portraits of your family. It's really wonderful how it jumps around, but in a way that's really easy to follow. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, there wasn't, there isn't one chapter that's longer than 900 words. Um, and a lot of them are shorter and, when I when I broke things down, it was sort of like I could tell the cancer story in in one little chapter, and then I could talk about Susan Sontag in another, and then I could talk about my stepdaughter, the violinist, in another, and then I could talk about you know the girl who died in my class in another, and there's a when you when you when you write these very short chapters, there's a sort of understanding that it's not just going to be a linear narrative. Yeah. And so that gave me the freedom to sort of bounce around. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that happened is when I started writing these chapters, these funny chapter titles emerged that just, that was just like a great 
you know, it was like popcorn popping. And so I suddenly had these funny chapter titles um, that I, I'm just looking through the book. Like the first one is called Cookies and Milk. One is called Jumping. It's not so funny. One is called The Thing About Illness. When I talk to various doctors, one is called What I Said to the Doctor. And the next one is called What I Wanted to Say to the Doctor. Mm-hmm. The next one is called What the Doctor Said to Me. Yeah. And so they're they're kind of like billboards. And they felt like I was screaming, you know, these sort of funny chapter heads and 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 it was a it was sort of a way of making the story a little more fun. The other thing that happened in these later stages of writing, so we're talking like three years, two or three years after I was treated, I kind of knew at that point that my cancer was not going to come back right away. And the first two years are key for the kind of cancer I had. So for the first two years, I was sort of holding my breath. Yeah. And so I didn't really know what kind of story I was telling. You know, was I going to be writing about like, oh, by the way, now I have cancer again? Yeah. In chapter 14. Right. Um, as you write. Yeah. But once I started rewriting it in these funny long chapter, uh, funny short chapters, by that time, I, I knew I was kind of out of the woods in in the most immediate way. And so there was a, a lightness, more lightness than there could have been early on. And I could sort of, you know, see that I wasn't writing a, you know, recurring cancer memoir, fortunately. At the end of the second year, trying the end at the end of the second year after treatment, I had a PET scan and my doctor and PET scans are like the most terrifying thing in the world um, because they what they do is is you drink all this stuff and if you have any cancer cells in your body they light up with a right. PET scan and so they, they kind of look inside your your soul they can read your thoughts but they can also you know read your your illness and it's it's absolutely terrifying and I got this PET scan and my doctor said tell tell them to to call me right away with the results and here's my number. And I, I didn't hear from him for a week. And I was like, oh my God, you know, this is terrible. And I finally get the results. And he says, you're fine. It's great. You know, it's fantastic. And then like a week later was locked down for COVID. Oh my God. <laughs> so wow. I was I had like a half, it was like, you know, every night on the news, there'd be like, well, in China and in California. And yeah. I kept thinking, oh my God, this thing. So I went from being terrified that I had cancer to being terrified everyone was going to die of COVID. And so I write about that in the book and about how that that sort of being a cancer patient helped me or what it was like to go from, you know, one personal fear to one kind of global fear. Yeah, interesting. And so I try to, you know, reflect the fear that we all have, but also in a weird way, the absurdity that we all live with, right? Mm-hmm. And the the kind of craziness, um, and the uh, and basically the <clears throat> the absurdity and also the uncertainties of of all of our lives, right? And there's <clears throat> there's a lot of humor in that, or you have to find the humor in that, yeah. right? Or else you Definitely. kind of go nuts. Yeah, you may go nuts anyway, but but it, it's um, but I think the humor it, it's hard to find the humor, but I that's always a, a coping mechanism. You know, standing stand up comic comics always had miserable childhoods, and you know right. they, they they're dealing with a lot of angst that that humor kind of helps discharge. But also, and, yeah, also real therapy, not coping mechanism in the sense of avoidance, but in the sense of actually lightening things. Yeah, and discharging yeah. a lot of the fear that we feel, and you know, it's like. There are lots of jokes about divorce, about marriage, about sex, mm-hmm. about things that are very complicated and often painful, you know, and um, and cancer. There's a, a, a an Instagram account called Humor Beats Cancer. Oh, that's good. I mean, yeah, okay. yeah. That's so good. it's it's and even though we don't think cancer memoirs should be funny, and quite a lot of them are not, because there's often not much to be funny about cancer patients can, can, we appreciate humor. Yeah, who says? I think cancer memoirs should be fun. Well, how else can you deal with the 
the uncertainties of it, you know, and the craziness of it. And also all the, the, the people you have to deal with, you know, you, your life, you're not just doing this by yourself. You have all these characters and, and your hair falls out and, and, yeah. you know, there's lots of, uh, what's the word? There, there's just lots of absurdity around it that I think humor helps to, to dis, discharge and dispel. If we're lucky, if we're lucky. If we're lucky. Yeah. yeah. Right. If we can find it. I'm curious about rewriting illness, the beginning piece of your title, and just wondering which things you wanted to rewrite or what rewriting means for you. Well, it's interesting. That title was not my title. Okay. The, the title, <laughs> no, I, no, and I love the title. I, um, uh, when I sold the book, I had, I had like 25 different titles and, and I sold the book and we all said the title, whatever title it was at that moment, we all said, not great. And the, the publisher came up with the whole title and I loved it the minute I saw it. And it took me a long time to sort of figure out what it meant. But, you know, when you, when you go through an illness or any experience, but so let's say an illness, you go through an illness and you're just you kind of dealing with this wave that's hit you. Yeah. And in my case, I was riddled with fear. And as you know, most people are, and, you know, my fear kind of got in the way of, of doing certain things that I maybe should have done. But then rewriting illness is I, I'm going to now I'm going to tell you the story of my illness from a distance. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you what I wish I'd known then I'm going to tell you how I think about it now. And I'm going to make it come out differently, or I'm going to, <clears throat> I'm going to be a different person than the person I was when I was living through it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a funny person. I'm going to be a person with funny titles, banners across my head, instead of just this puddle of fear that I was <laughs> when I was going through it. Yeah, right. Um, and so I think that's what, what it means to me. You know, one of the things being a writer, I had a, an experience, which I, I don't talk about very much, but I got divorced from my husband and he died several months later wow. and it was thought that he committed suicide. And I, this was in 1996, a long time ago. And I wrote a novel about this called Almost. And a lot of the novel was fiction, but it was inspired by this event. And, you know, how do you, what do you do with that experience? Yeah. And when I started writing it, I started writing the story as a memoir. And then I, had written some funny stories about a woman getting divorced and sort of going on crazy dates. And one day I said, well, what if I combine these two things? And then suddenly it became the same story of this woman whose husband dies, but she has a sense of humor that I didn't have in real life. Mm -hmm. And, and so the book became something very different, but it was still the same story. And so as a right, and, but I knew when I was writing the memoir about my my ex husband dying, it was so dreary. It was like I just thought I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to write about this. It's so dreary. If I don't want to write about it, nobody's going to want to read about it. And so when you rewrite something, mm -hmm. you know, you 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 add you. Um, it's like a it's like a recipe that you add a different spice to, or a recipe that you you add egg whites to, and so it you know, it becomes a souffle instead of just like a meatloaf. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think writers are doing a lot. You know, you, something happens to you or you, you think of something and instead of just writing out what happened, you know, you rewrite it and you get, you make it so that somebody else is going to be interested in it besides just your friends. Yeah. You know? And you also have the opportunity to tell a new story about your own experience of it. And then maybe you even get if you want to, you can kind of live inside that new version that has more humor. Yeah, yeah. But I think we're always rewriting stories as writers, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's what we do. Um, but I was very aware of how dreary the story my ex-husband's death was. And I just was writing it and thinking, I, I don't even want to write this. And so when I could rewrite it, you know, with it really became something dramatically different. And And, you know, there's a there's a sort of saying about writers is, you know, you become a writer so you can rewrite your life. So yeah. you can tell a story a different way, or you can control the story. Mm -hmm. And it it always sounds a bit sort of like a pathology, but that's what people do, you know, but yeah. I, I, I have <laughs> composer friends who 
who have tragedies and they write symphonies based on those tragedies, mm-hmm. right? And you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't think, oh, that's what he's writing about. He's writing about the time, you know, when his wife left him. But no, that's not that's not what you hear. You hear something, you hear something else. So that's what artists are always doing. Anyway, so the rewriting illness was a way of presenting it to people so that they would want to read it instead of just feeling sorry for me. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else you want to share about the book? Well, I, I guess what one of the things I, I mean, maybe we've talked about this, uh, you know, around it, but I've done a lot of interviews and public things and several people who've interviewed me have said, I didn't really want to read your book. You know, I, I had to read it because mm-hmm. I was interviewing you. I, I was, I was afraid to read it. Uh, I was afraid to sort of spend time with you in this illness. But once mm-hmm. I started it, I really liked it. You know, it, it, and people say, I really enjoyed reading it. And then they say, oh, well, mm, I not to, or maybe I'm not yeah. supposed to enjoy it. So it's very hard to, I, I guess I want to, if, if anybody's interested, it, you know, it, it is, it is about cancer, but it's all about a lot of other things. And, and it also has a happy ending. Let's put it that Yeah, <laughs> that's important. But I did try to rewrite you know, what happened and and bring something to it that wasn't there when I was going through it. Mm-hmm. And I could do that because of the time that had elapsed. And also because I was very interested in not writing a tip, if you will, a typical cancer memoir, that's just like this happened to me. It was awful. Right. And, uh, now I'm and it really does. Yeah. I mean, I think you succeeded in that. It reads, it reads more like a memoir than a cancer memoir. I mean, like I, I got to know you. Oh, and it was really you. nice. Yeah. It was like, all these little anecdotes going, joining you for different moments in your life, much Thank bigger you. than cancer. Yeah. Thank you. I, and one thing that it's very much a New York story. I live in New York mm-hmm. city. I grew up in New York. I, I left for a long time, but I came back and it, it's very much about the city and being mm-hmm. in the city and, and certain parts of city life. And somebody, one of the reviews said something like, well, not everyone is going to identify with, with, mm-hmm going to Zabar's <laughs> or walking across Central Park. Like, like that was some incredible privilege. Like I walked across Central Park after I had a cancer treatment. Okay. I, I, <laughs> some of that was considered like some incredible privilege, even That's though funny. it's where I live and I wasn't taking a limousine, you know, I was walking in the cold, <laughs> but, but it's a very New York story. And I live on the Upper West Side and, you know, so it's, a, it's an urban story. Uh, it's not a suburban story. I mean, I, I'm an urban person, so I love reading urban books. I, I'm not crazy about stories set on That's farms, true. you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like if it's set on a farm, okay, maybe I'll read it, but it's not going to be the first thing I go to. Um, <laughs> Some people are afraid of cancer memoirs. You're afraid of <laughs> farm memoirs. <laughs> right, right. No farm memoirs for me. <laughs> But anyway, so I, I I like the idea that it's a sort of herb. Somebody a review said it was a, a New York City cancer memoir. I was like, yes, yes, okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for your interest. And and I do I do I, I guess since I have the the floor for a moment, um, I do want to encourage people in all seriousness. If you have if you feel something weird in your body, if you feel weird, deal with it get it taken care of, be brave. And the sooner you do this, if if there is something wrong with you, the better your chances are of coming out of it well. And there are just amazing cancer breakthroughs all the time. And just hang in there, you know, and do it. Bring whoever you need to bring, bring your best friend, get somebody to come with you if you're afraid. People will come, call me up, I'll come with you if you're afraid. No, I mean, being in this club, it's like you really want to help people. Yeah. And nobody wants to be in this club. But once you're in it, there's a lot of, let's say, sisterhood and brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And I feel that deeply. If you enjoyed this conversation, please leave a review in your podcast app. Cancer Talks is a platform for anyone who has been touched by cancer. Write to us at info at cancertalks.com if you have a story to share. 
If you're moved to donate, please visit cancertalks.com slash donate.